So a very common view is that faith is belief that lacks evidence in support of it. And one can put a positive spin on that and one can also put a negative spin on that. So let's look at the negative spin first. This would be an angle on the topic that's been promoted quite heavily by figures in the New Atheist movement in the past 10-15 years or so. And the idea is that just what it is for something to, to be faith is, is for it to be a belief in a proposition, for example, that God exists, where that belief uh, lacks evidence or possibly even um, goes against strong evidence. And um, that's um, deemed to be irrational. Um, and um, the thought is that, that that's just kind of constitutive of what it is to have religious faith, is, is to, to lack evidence in support of the propositions that you believe, or, or even to fly in the face of evidence. And that's something we're probably all quite familiar with. The positive spin that one could put on this is um, a view that sometimes known as fideism, um, fides, the, the Latin for faith. Um, fideism says that it's, it's positively a virtue to believe some proposition again, for example, that God exists without having any evidence. And perhaps that's because it, it's a sign of one's loyalty and commitment to God that one's able to believe that God exists without any positive evidence for that whatsoever. Okay, so, but I think both the negative spin and the positive spin are, are essentially different kind of evaluations of the same uh, understanding of what faith is, namely uh, belief in a proposition where that belief lacks any supporting evidence. Now, I want to suggest that that's a somewhat inadequate model of faith. Um, and I think we can see that because actually we don't just use the word faith in religious contexts, we use it more broadly. We talk about having faith in a person, or we, we might say to a friend, I, I have faith that you're going to pass this exam. And when we look closely at those sorts of examples, it seems pretty clear that we're not saying that there's no evidence. It, you know. So it might be that uh, I've got a, a, a strong track record of seeing that my friend does very well in exams, and perhaps on this occasion my friend is having a wobble, and I say to her, I have faith that you're going to do this, you're going to do well in this exam. And I think that we can draw from that that faith, uh, that what, what faith involves is, is more than just a propositional belief. I want to suggest that faith has at least two components, and, and this is a view that's becoming increasingly popular in contemporary philosophy of religion. So the two components would be firstly an, an, intellectual, uh, an intellectual component, so the belief that your friend is going to pass the exam or that God exists, or it might not even rise to the level of a belief, it might be a bit weaker than that. But nonetheless, it's an intellectual attitude towards a proposition. That, that on its own wouldn't be sufficient for faith, I want to suggest. It seems as though for something to be an attitude of faith, there has to be this second component, a volitional component that has to do with the will. Let me just illustrate with another non-religious example. So suppose that I am about to do a parachute jump for the first time out of a plane at 30,000 feet. And suppose I know the person who is packing the parachute and I know that they've done this thousands of times, there's never been any problems. So I've got a, a really good amount of evidence that the parachute is going to work. Now the plane goes up, the door opens and I'm standing there and I'm faced with the decision of whether to jump. And suppose I do jump, it seems to me that I manifest faith that the parachute is going to work. And those two components seem to be present. So I have the intellectual, um, intellectual confidence that the parachute has been packed properly. And as I said, that does seem to be based on evidence in this case. Now, you'll notice that it, it seems like the evidence falls short of giving me complete certainty. So there is room for a little bit of doubt, that kind of nagging worry at the back of my mind. But I do have a good amount of evidence, it's just that it doesn't give me total certainty. So that's one component. On the other hand, I have chosen to act in a way that manifests a willingness to 
to act as though it's the case that the parachute is going to work. And so there's that volitional component. And I want to suggest that, that faith in God or religious faith in, in um, beings um, that might not be characterised in that kind of monotheistic way also has those two components. And so um, it seems to me that when we have that kind of model of faith in view, we, we don't any longer need to think of faith as being necessarily irrational. Faith, of course, can be irrational because it could be that someone has their intellectual component not based on sufficient evidence. But that, that isn't kind of conceptually built into what faith is in the way that that first definition of faith has faith as belief that lacks evidence in support of it almost builds that into it. Now um, there have been some important philosophers in the last 50-60 years who have wanted to argue that uh, religious belief in God doesn't need to be based on evidence. It can be, <coughs> but it doesn't need to be based on evidence in order to be rational. And Alvin Plantinga would be a particularly important figure who has argued this. And Plantinga basically is taking aim at the view, which was very common when he was first advocating these, uh, these ideas in the mid-20th uh, century. He's taking aim at the view that in order for a belief to be rational, it's either got to be something that's directly based on sensory experience, like that there's a hand in front of my face, or it's got to be sort of self-evident, like that two and two equals four, or it's got to be based on an argument that derives ultimately from something that's either evident to the senses or self-evident. And so that's a very narrow conception of what could, could be a rational belief. And I think Plantinga rightly uh, wanted to, uh, to, to attack that position and, and to argue that, it, that it's inadequate. But I think the flaw in Plantinga's approach was to accept the notion of evidence that was, that was given to him by that kind of logical positivist approach. So Plantinga unquestioningly really takes on the idea that, that in order to have evidence, one must have a sort of argument, a propositional argument that one would be able to articulate. And so given that definition of evidence, he wants to say, well, People don't need evidence in order to have a rational religious belief. Now, I want to suggest that rather than, um, rather than say that, what we could instead say is that evidence is much broader than what the logical positivists thought. Evidence doesn't have to be an argument that one would be able to articulate. It could include things like an intuition, a, a religious experience, um, a sort of insight that one would be very hard pressed to put into words. So it could encompass all of these kinds of things. And if we have this broader, more permissive definition of evidence, then I think we can say that, that basically the same thing that, that was motivating planting it, namely that in order to have a rational religious belief, one doesn't have to have the leisure to pore over sophisticated philosophical arguments all day long. The, the ordinary religious believer in the pew, just based on their um, religious experiences, their experience of prayer, the kinds of intuitions they have when they read religious scripture and so on, that those things could be sufficient for having a rational religious belief. When we come across a situation where there's deep and profound disagreement, it's quite natural for us to want to look for an explanation for that disagreement. And it's natural to wonder whether there is something about the evidence that we have on that topic that it can explain why there's such a diversity of opinion. When it comes to religious disagreement, the disagreement is, is quite profound. It's been going on for a very long time, it's entrenched, it's been going on for centuries. It involves a whole constellation of interconnected topics and it's widespread. It involves hundreds of millions of people with mutually incompatible views. And so it, it is quite natural to wonder, well, is this disagreement explained by the fact that the evidence is ambiguous in some sense? 
Now, I think a really important point I want to make, and, and this is something I explore in my book, Evidential Ambiguity in Religious Belief, is that evidential ambiguity is always, relev is always relative to a particular agent. If we had complete omniscience, if we had, if you like, a God's eye perspective on the world, there would be no ambiguity at all. The ambiguity, if there is such, consists in a relationship between our cognitive faculties, the types of minds we have, and the, the, the vantage point from which we're exercising our cognitive faculties, and the facts out there. There's, there's something in that three-way relation that, that amounts to um, a, a, an ambiguous situation. And so it seems to me important to, to think about what it might mean to say that the evidence is ambiguous. And so that's, that's the topic of, of my book, Evidential Ambiguity in Religious Belief. And I, I basically look at a number of different accounts of, of what it could mean to, to say that the evidence is ambiguous. And firstly, we could think about an account that says what it means for the evidence to be ambiguous is that the, the evidence is evenly balanced between two or more opposing views. And I think what we're looking for here, it ideally, is an account of evidential ambiguity that is not going to be tendentious. It's not going to be one that, that kind of presupposes some particular worldview or religious outlook. And the problem with this first account, the one that says the evidence is evenly balanced, is that it is tendentious. It, it presupposes the falsity of any worldview or perspective other than the purest form of agnosticism. Another way that we could characterize the evidence as being ambiguous is to compare the evidence concerning religious uh, questions with two other sorts of beliefs that, that we all hold that we could call Maurian beliefs and Cartesian beliefs. Maurian beliefs named after the Cambridge philosopher G. E. Moore are beliefs in if you like, common sense propositions that, that seem overwhelmingly obviously true to us, such as that there are two hands in front of my face. Now, Moore recognised that beliefs like this are threatened by sceptical scenarios, such as the possibility that I'm dreaming or that I'm in the matrix, that kind of thing. But Moore wanted to say that we can be more sure that, for example, there are two hands in front of my face, than we can be of the slightly complicated philosophical reasoning that would go into any sceptical argument aimed at refuting my knowledge of there being two hands in front of my face. So we can make a contrast between Maurian beliefs and, and beliefs about religious questions. And the contrast would be that Maurian beliefs are, in some sense, on a surer footing epistemically than, than these worldview or these religious beliefs. That's one contrast we could draw. Another contrast we could draw would, would be between worldview beliefs and Cartesian beliefs. So Cartesian beliefs named after Rene Descartes, the philosopher who thought that there's a certain type of belief that we can be totally certain of. Um, and that's, that's to say a, a belief of the form, it appears to me that there are two hands in front of my face. Not that there are two hands in front of my face, but that it appears to me that there are two hands in front of my face. Descartes wanted to say, I can't doubt that it appears to me that there are two hands in front of my face. Because that's just a belief about the contents of my own mind. It's not a belief about how the external world is. It's completely compatible with my dreaming or being in the matrix and so on, that it appears to me that there are two hands in front of my face. So, so I can't doubt, according to Descartes, that, I, that it appears to me that there are two hands in front of my face. So you might think that Cartesian beliefs are, have the surest footing of all. And so again, we can draw a contrast and say that Cartesian beliefs are on a stronger footing epistemically than worldview beliefs. And so I think that this is an interesting point of contrast we can draw between worldview beliefs and Maurian and Cartesian beliefs. I will say, though, that scientific beliefs are also on a weaker epistemic footing than these other two types of beliefs. Because scientific beliefs don't have that kind of uh, 
immediacy, that obviousness that, that the proposition that there are two hands in front of my face does. Scientific beliefs are usually based on a number of observations and sometimes quite complex inferences from those observations. And it seems to me that you know, there are many scientific beliefs that we wouldn't want to say are ambiguous in any significant sense. They're not evidentially ambiguous in the way that questions about worldview, questions about the existence of God and, and souls and so on are. So I think that this contrast is, is interesting to some degree, but, but I would note that, that there are many beliefs that we wouldn't normally think of as being evidentially ambiguous that are also in a weaker epistemic situation than Morian and Cartesian beliefs. Finally, we can come to a way of characterizing evidential ambiguity that I think applies to the situation with worldview beliefs and that I think is both um, it's not tendentious, it's kind of worldview neutral, and it also is, is genuinely interesting. It doesn't just apply to, to the majority of our beliefs. And that's to say that we have a set of evidence that has some portions which strongly point in one direction, and it also has portions which strongly point in another direction. And it's very important to note that this does not imply that the evidence is evenly balanced. It seems to me that this is the situation that we have when it comes to the God question. The facts about the evil and suffering in the world, if taken in isolation, point strongly towards atheism. On the other hand, facts about fine-tuning, consciousness and so on, it seems to me, point strongly in the direction of some kind of transcendence, some kind of intelligence behind the world. And again, that doesn't imply that it's, it's an even balanced situation. And I think we could add to this characterization by noting that the, the quantity of evidence and the complexity of it and the, the kind of expertise that's needed to evaluate much of it means that, it's, it, that there's a kind of information processing challenge. The, the ordinary person trying to decide what to believe in this, on these questions can easily be overwhelmed. There's, there's a vast amount of evidence. And what that means is that it, we can very easily have a situation where one person is exposed only to a certain part of the evidence, another person is exposed only to a, a different portion of the evidence. They end up disagreeing, but it's not because of a, a failure of rationality on, on the part of either of them. So here it seems to me we have a way of characterizing the evidence pertaining to worldview questions as being ambiguous, which is non-tendentious. It doesn't presuppose the truth of any particular worldview or religious outlook. And it's genuinely interesting. When we look at most scientific beliefs, most scientific theories that are well established, we don't have a situation where the evidence is like that. We don't have a situation where some portion of the evidence strongly points to its falsity while another portion strongly points to its truth. That's not a characterization that is true of well established scientific beliefs. And so we have a, a characterization which is interesting in, in that it applies specifically to beliefs about religion and worldview and not to a wide range of our other beliefs. So when it comes to this question of how to investigate ultimate reality, how to investigate questions about whether there's a God and what that God might be like, whether there's an afterlife and so on. It seems to me that we could contrast two broad approaches, two broad schools of thought. And I would like to give the labels to them of uh, the involved approach and the detached approach. So the involved approach would be an approach that says that the, 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 the only way to get the very best evidence on these topics is to step inside a particular religious or spiritual tradition, um, take on its beliefs, um, involve oneself in its practices, and be opened up to the insights that, that might only be able to be gained through embedding oneself in that tradition. And this would be an approach that's advocated by philosophers such as um, John Cottingham, Paul Moser and Mark Wynne. 
On the other hand, we've got an approach that we could call the detached approach, which aspires to be in some sense scientific about trying to investigate these worldview questions. And this would be an approach that's advocated, among others, by the philosopher Richard Swinburne. The detached approach tries to use some kind of methodology, and that could be the probabilistic methodology of Bayes' theorem, um, in order to assign weights to each of the different bits of evidence and then try to add them all up and, and work out which way they point overall. In terms of the involved approach, the upside is that it, it takes seriously the, the possibility that there might be types of evidence that are inaccessible to us other than by stepping inside a particular way of seeing the world. And it seems to me that especially if some form of theism turns out to be true. The involved approach is going to be needed in order to get at some aspects of reality. Because theism says, after all, that uh, the foundation of reality is a personal agent. And personal agents can only be known through certain methods. Uh, that there's lots of arguments in the philosophy of mind for thinking that a purely third-person scientific lens on the world can't disclose certain facts about people's mental states. And I, I take those arguments very seriously. And if those arguments are right, it seems that knowing another person is going to require certain methods that are, that are in a sense, not scientific. There needs to be some kind of two-way encounter between myself and the, the other that I'm trying to get to know. And so it seems to me that if theism is true, then the involved approach is going to be needed to access some aspects of reality. On the other hand, if naturalism is true, then perhaps there won't be anything more than a third-person scientific approach that's needed to access, in principle, all aspects of reality. The downside with the involved approach is that it, it doesn't really offer any resources for answering the question, which worldview should I step inside? It's not as if there are just a couple of options. There are a huge number of options. How am I supposed to choose which one to, to situate myself inside? And furthermore, how would I know if I've got the right one after I've stepped inside it? And it, and it seems to me that the, the involved approach doesn't really have the resources to answer those questions. Turning to the detached approach, the, the upside of the detached approach is that it, it doesn't require one to commit oneself already to a worldview in order to begin the investigation. And after all, the person who is a spiritual or religious inquirer who doesn't know what they think at the outset is going to typically want some methodology that, that could help them figure out, well, if not which one is true, which, which options are more promising and are worth investigating more closely. And, and the detached approach claims to be able to offer a methodology for investigating that question without having to make a commitment beforehand. The problem with the detached approach, it seems to me, is that it, it's not that plausible that our pre-existing intuitions, biases, and so on will, will not color the way in which we try to uh, follow through this procedure of assigning weights to the different pieces of evidence and adding them all up. The philosopher Robert McKim has suggested that it's hard to think of a case where a philosopher has used a method like this and arrived at a conclusion that's radically different from where they started. And, and that's a bit worrying. It suggests that perhaps we're kidding ourselves if we think we can really be that detached and, and kind of bracket out all of our prior intuitions and, and inclinations on these topics. So I've suggested that there are problems with both the involved approach and the detached approach. It seems to me that a third way between these options would be to say that grappling very seriously with the evidence is rationally required in order to arrive at a view on these worldview questions. And yet that we have to take seriously the way in which holistic intuitions profoundly shape our judgments on these topics which is to say 
it's not simply a case of trying to aggregate a bunch of smaller judgments about individual bits of evidence and, and add them up, as if I didn't already have some inclination about which total picture was right. Rather, we, we, we do come to this data with some overarching sense of which picture as a whole seems to make the most sense. And, and that is something that we can legitimately allow to shape our inquiry. And that doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to individual bits of evidence and trying to assess how much weight they have, but that, that we, we take very seriously and don't try to sort of bracket out these holistic intuitions that we have. And it seems to me we could think of an analogy with looking at a painting. Suppose I'm looking at a, a beautiful work of art in, in a gallery. I have a, a reaction to that painting as a piece of work uh, in total. I, I have a holistic impression about that painting and what it says to me. And that holistic judgment is not just a matter of, if you like, dividing the painting into, let's say, a hundred squares and, and having a reaction to each of them individually and then somehow adding that all up. No, there's, there's a kind of holistic reaction that I have to that painting that is more than the sum of those individual judgments. But of course, my feelings about the individual pieces of the painting are shaping that, that total holistic judgment. But I'm not in any sense trying to pretend that my holistic view of the painting is simply a matter of my reaction to individual bits of the painting all aggregated together as it were. So I think this is a really interesting question. In general, can it be the case that an evidentially ambiguous situation is itself evidence that favours some hypothesis over other hypotheses? And I think it can be the case. So for example, suppose we have a situation where the lead guitarist of a famous rock band disappears and his car is found near to a bridge over a wide and deep river and no note is found and his body is never found. So it looks like we have a somewhat ambiguous situation here. It's unclear what happened to him. One possibility, of course, is that he committed suicide. Another possibility is that he ran away somewhere else, started a new life. It seems to me, though, that if we have some further information, for example, that this guitarist had a personality such that if he was going to end his life, he would have wanted his fans to know why. Whereas if he was going to run away and start a new life, he would have wanted the evidence to be somewhat murky so that it would be hard for people to trace him and maybe it would create intrigue about his fate. So the situation as described seems to be one where the hypothesis that he ran away and started a new life actually predicts that we would have a murky evidential situation. And so that, that situation of evidential ambiguity actually ends up being evidence that favours this hypothesis over the other one. So it does seem in general terms that we can have a situation where evidential ambiguity is itself evidence for a particular view over against others. So what we're trying to do is figure out which hypothesis, if any, more strongly leads us to expect an evidentially ambiguous situation. And to the extent that that hypothesis does more strongly lead us to expect an evidentially ambiguous situation, that evidential ambiguity will itself be evidence for that hypothesis. So when we come to the worldview question, there are many hypotheses on the table. There are many different worldviews. But just for simplicity's sake for the moment, let's pick two hypotheses, namely theism and naturalism. And what we want to do is ask, does one of these hypotheses more strongly lead us to expect an evidentially ambiguous world, where an evidentially ambiguous world is one that contains evidence um, some of which strongly points in one direction and some of which strongly points in another. And, and to emphasize that doesn't mean that the evidence need be evenly balanced. And so it seems to me that 
we need to be really careful when we do this that we don't double count evidence. We, we have to proceed as though we've already taken into account all of the other evidence, the, the usual evidence that is brought forward in these debates, such as the evidence from evil, fine-tuning, consciousness, and so on. And what we need to do is, is to ask, if God exists and there's evil in the world, and there's fine-tuning and consciousness, how strongly does that package of things lead us to expect there to be an evidentially ambiguous situation? And then we need to compare that with the hypothesis that naturalism is true, so there's no God, and at bottom there's just mass energy, and there's fine-tuning, and there's uh, consciousness and evil and suffering. And the question is, how strongly does that package of things lead us to expect an evidentially ambiguous situation? And if one of those packages more strongly leads us to expect evidential ambiguity, then to that extent, evidential ambiguity is evidence for that hypothesis. And so what I want to suggest is that actually evidential ambiguity doesn't end up being very strong evidence over and above all of the usual evidences that are brought forward. That's to say, evid an evidentially ambiguous situation is fairly strongly to be expected given the existence of God and the existence of evil, consciousness, fine-tuning and so on. And also, an evidentially ambiguous situation is fairly strongly to be expected given naturalism plus fine-tuning, consciousness, evil, and so on. Why is that? Well, let's start with naturalism. Again, if naturalism is true and there's a fine-tuned universe which contains conscious beings and there's evil and suffering, that's going to be a world in which the evidence is very mixed because, after all, the fine-tuning is going to point in the direction of some kind of design behind the universe, but on the other hand, the presence of evil and suffering is going to point in the other direction. Another way to put it is that any universe that is fine-tuned such that it can contain those conscious observers is going to appear designed, whether or not it in fact is. And so it seems to me that naturalism plus that package of things that, that constitute the usual evidence leads us fairly strongly to expect an evidentially ambiguous situation. Then turning to theism, if God exists and there is evil and suffering, and that must mean that, that God has good reasons to allow that evil and suffering, and there's consciousness and fine-tuning and so on, that is um, going to be an evidentially ambiguous situation because, again, um, you're going to have portions of the evidence that quite strongly point in one direction and other portions of the evidence which quite strongly point in the other direction. And, and I would just add again, because we're considering a hypothesis on which God exists and there's evil and suffering in the world, that must mean that given the truth of that hypothesis, God has good reasons to allow that evil and suffering. And those reasons it seems to me, may well include reasons for God to be epistemically distant from human beings to some degree. To be, that is to say, to be somewhat hidden from human beings. And just to unpack that thought a bit further, um, one of the leading kinds of theodicies attempts to explain why God would allow evil and suffering is, is the so-called soul-making theodicy, which has been advocated, among others, by the philosopher John Hick. The idea there is roughly that among the reasons God has for allowing evil and suffering is that God wants human beings to be able to cultivate virtuous characters, to be able to cultivate courage, patience, generosity and so on. And, and the only way that people can do that is in situations of adversity, danger, uh, scarcity and so on. And Hick's thought is that God needs to be somewhat epistemically distant from humans. God's existence needs to be somewhat veiled from humans if that soul-making arena is going to work. Because if humans are constantly certain of the existence of God, who's a God who's going to eventually um, right all wrongs and, and, and put all injustices right, uh, then the soul-making um, arena isn't going to work. And so all that to say, 
given that we're considering a hypothesis on which God exists and there's evil and suffering, which means that God must have good reasons to allow that evil and suffering. If those sorts of reasons for allowing evil and suffering are, are in the mix, then that's a further reason to think that, that a world in which that package of things is true is going to be a world in which there's evidential ambiguity. All that to say, it seems to me that theism and naturalism lead us in roughly equal measure to expect an evidentially ambiguous situation. If that's right, what that means is that evidential ambiguity itself doesn't really add anything over and above all of the usual evidences that are brought forward in this debate. Mm -hmm.